when you broke in, I think it was two weeks you had to break in. You had to study the jobs and you had to learn how they worked and so forth. And you had to take two trips on a through freight to White River Junction. You had to work two local freights. And one of the locals I worked was the BB local with uh, Eddie Shuler's father, Ted, who was very helpful. Then the passenger trains, the same thing. You had to work a through, through passenger train. Uh, I had two trips to Concord. And then uh, you had to work a local passenger train. And the train that I worked happened to be Bedford. And I was in Boston at, at uh, well, this was a night train uh, that went out to Bedford. At that time, the, uh, the White River runs had the Bedford trains attached to the run. So they had to make a trip to Bedford, then back to Boston, then up to White River. So uh, they assigned me to go out on the last train to Bedford because that's the one that came back. <laughs> so, but of course this was, you know, uh, early, uh, well, early spring in March, so it was dark. And uh, so uh, the crew dispatcher took me down to one of the brakemen there, which, of course, I worked with him afterwards. He's a nice guy, but was sort of a gruff type, you know. And uh, said, you, you know, I want to take this fellow out and show him around. He, what can I show him in the dark, he said. It's going to be pitch dark out there. Well, he said he's got to go out, he said, and get his paper signed. You had to have it signed by the conductors. So the other brakeman on the train was uh, uh, a guy from White River Junction, also a nice fellow, Eddie Millick. And he, and he said, you come with me and I'll, I'll take you out and show you around. He said, see. So that was my first experience with Bedford. And we get out there, like you said, in the pitch dark. And, and uh, so they stopped and uh, got water for the engine. And then we went around the Y. And I had no idea <laughs> where I was because it was, you know, he went right in the woods. And uh, so the brakeman got off and he threw the switches, of course, and, and uh, explained to me what he did. But like I said, I had no, I couldn't see a thing out there at, at that time. So that, uh, and then we went back down to the station and then come back into Boston. So that was my first experience with, with Bedford. Well, the Wright River jobs, as I say, at that time, they, they all had to make a side trip. Uh, it was 307, it was a noontime train to Montreal, but uh, first we had to go in and make the trip to Lexington. And it happened that my best uh, friend, uh, Red McHugh, was uh, working out of Bedford at the time. So we'd pull into the side track at Lexington and he'd come down through under the canopy and we'd be exchanging notes and, and, uh, and greetings across the, across the track every morning in the, in the uh, uh, Lexington station. Uh, so of course he, he had a high class job. He went into Boston and he had half the morning off, you know, before he had to make another trip. As I went back and I had to load a baggage car and then we went, as I say, from, from there to White River Junction. We enjoyed it out there. I liked that branch. It was sort of, you know, a lot of country, sort of country like and the old fashioned stations and and uh, and as I say, my, my friend Red McHugh and I, we worked out there together for quite a little while. And so we had a good time. We enjoyed it. And uh, we, we ended up dating a couple of girls from Lexington that rode the train, which of course made it, made it interesting. And uh, so, uh, and of course we had the steam engine in those days. So it was you know, nice. We had this, the engine crew. And of course at Bedford, we took the same routine, took the water and, and uh, went up and went around the Y, and uh, so it, it, uh, it, it was nice. I enjoyed it there, and the old station was, uh, was interesting. And of course, in those days, they had a, a bunk room in the station, so if we had to stay overnight, why, we stayed in the bunk room at the end of the station. And of course, when I started, they had the wooden cars with the open platforms. And uh, uh, which I liked, I liked those cars. Uh, the Bud cars were all right, but <laughs> I liked the old wooden cars that were nice to work and uh, had good heat, steam heat, you know. You had the gates, you didn't have to bother opening traps and 
doors they had the nice gates you swung and uh, so they were good to work and the baggage cars were good they had the nice big sliding doors it made uh, work in those days because you had to uh, every every terminal you went into you had to uh, cut the engine off and run around the train of course most places in those days we had the uh, uh, turntables so when you got, uh, for instance, like Wilmington, you got out there, you had to cut the engine, go up and come back onto the turntable. And, and uh, manual work in those days, there weren't any electric in <laughs> there. You pushed them by hand, see? And uh, you get a couple of guys on there and push the engine around, and, uh, uh, which, was, which was easy enough. If you had a good engineer, they could balance the, the engine just right. Uh, you could really push it around good, see? If you didn't have it balanced right, you, you could really strain yourself pushing that thing around. But that's what we did. Then they'd bring the, you had to bring the train back down off that track, back it onto the train. Then you had to hook up a steam hose in those days. We uh, had steam hose and, uh, of course, air hose and uh, air brake hose. And then you had cables overhead. We had to hook up uh, overhead lighting cables, came from the engine. And uh, they went in. And there was a receptacle in the car. You put the, put it into there, and you get the you got your power from the engine. Every once in a while, the the cable would come out, you know, en route, which left the cars in darkness. Because the B and M got cars from everywhere. Actually, they we we after that got Pennsylvania cars, which were red steel cars. And uh, those were those were all about the same idea, but they were closed at the ends. You had the vestibule, and then we got some cars from the Reading Company, and uh, they were steel cars and uh, uh, hard riding cars. Though they didn't really have much spring, and uh, they had the same thing: vestibules, and they had a combine with the doors. Didn't work as good as our wooden cars, but they worked, and. Uh, those had uh, lighting from the, uh, they had batteries, and they had a ca cabin at the end of the car, and you used to uh, have to, you know, get push the, the right valves to get the lights lit in the cars, and if one went out you know, if, uh, something, you'd have to change a fuse, and like you do at home, you have to change a fuse in the car. Uh, we had one conductor that was, uh, he, he liked to put on a good show, he liked to be the boss, you know, and, and uh, uh, show that he was in charge of everything. So uh, every once in a while, you'd see him go up and open the cabinet to the to the. Nothing was wrong, but he'd go up and open the cabinet, throw switches back and forth, and the lights would go on and off. And you know, people would think he was doing a heck of a job fixing the lights, see? and actually just just putting on a show. But after that, I think we had some Delaware Lackawanna cars, which were open platform. They were more or less like. Uh, uh, wooden cars, but these were steel cars, but they still had the open platform and the overhead lighting. And then we got, of course, after that, they went went into the bud cars, and uh, they were nice. They were nice new cars and all that, but uh, I, I missed the old cars and the engines, you know, because that did away with most of our engines. Uh, there again on the bud car, the same conductor that I mentioned, uh, I was well known uh, and still am for liking the heat, see, and of course the bud cars were air conditioned and if you lift them on, they got cold as the devil, you know. You, you, you'd be freezing sometimes on there and every, and so this guy, he loved to have that air conditioning on. It didn't matter, summer or winter, have air conditioning on. Of course, if it got too cold, I'd go up and turn it off, you know, and uh, He'd come right back and turn it on again. <laughs> it got to be a regular joke, see, that everybody, uh, that we were having this feud back and forth over the air conditioning. And it got to the point where I'd go up and turn it off, and I'd turn around, he'd be right behind me, turn it on again, see. And there was the four passengers, I said, gee, they don't know what's going on. It's warm, it's cold, it's warm. And they'd complain, you know, two or three of the girls every once in a while complain. They said, boy, Bob, it's cold in here. They, I said, tell me. <laughs> I said, I know it's cold, but I said, I, I try to get the heat up, but I said, you'll have to talk to the conductor. I said, I mean, but so that was, that was an a ongoing <laughs> situation that everybody got a kick out of, you know. When I was working out of Bedford, we had a, we used to come down in the mornings and 
We had a girl that lived two or three houses down from Brattle Station. And uh, every morning she was late running for the train. She'd, she, she'd admit that she waited till she heard the train come out of Lexington and she'd get up, see, and get ready for work. And she'd be rushing around to get before we, after we left Lexington to get down. And of course, naturally, most of the mornings we had to wait. And wait a minute, she'd be waving from down in the street. And we had to wait while she ran under the bridge and come running up the stairs and get on the train, see. So uh, uh, normally they weren't too enthused, you know, waiting for too long for people. But uh, everybody got such a kick out of her that uh, and the, even the passengers got so they, they oh, wait, I, I forget her name, but this was Mary. Wait for Mary, wait for Mary. Yeah, she's coming, you know. So that was that was a, a every morning experience there. So that was some, something to look forward to watching her run for the train. But uh, I said, she's a girl after my own heart because I hated to get up myself, you know. And I said, well, I don't blame her. She waited until she heard the train and she decided to get up. Speaking of the Lexington branch, I, I actually walked uh, uh, most parts of that branch, <laughs> I walked, because uh, the first time, uh, we had a snowstorm in 1947, and uh, a blizzard, and there was high, high snow, the snow was packed right up. They sent out a snow plow uh, to plow the, the branch lines. So they called me to cover the snow plow, and I think this was on, it was on a Sunday. So I went down to the depot and got uh, a noon train out of Lowell to go in to cover the snow plow. And uh, we just had an old mogul on there, and, and uh, the poor thing it did pretty well, it, it, but it got as far as it could go plowing the snow, and it got to North Woburn and stopped. It just couldn't plow any more snow. So we couldn't we couldn't get it to to push any more. So we we had to stay in North Woburn for a couple of hours, and uh, till the next train come down from Lowell, and they hooked on to the rear and pushed the both of the trains in. So of course I was late. It was late uh, by the time we left the the uh, terminal in Boston because they had to wait for us to get in there. So we went out on the Lexington branch. So we got to Arlington. The move was that they were going to go into the sidetrack at Arlington and plow that out. And then they were going to come back down and pick us up and go up the main line and plow that. So he left the, myself and there was another brakeman. He was fairly new, this other brakeman. Of course, I was <laughs> fairly new myself then. But anyway, uh, they took off and uh, they left us there. So after a while, I said, you know, I said, I think that uh, they left us here. I said, they, I don't see anything of the train, do you? He said, no. He said, what are we going to do? I said, well, we're not going to stand here and freeze, I said. So I said, we might just as well start walking. And I said, <laughs> well, it's better than standing still and freezing. We'll walk and at least keep warm that way. And I said, uh, we might catch up with them somewhere. So we walked, I think, from Arlington up to Arlington Heights. And uh, by this time, you know, plowing through snow and everything, we're getting a little weary and getting cold. And, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, we were so happy to see two taillights coming back toward us. Uh, the, the engineer, the conductor had realized by the time he got up to Arlington Heights, I guess, that uh, uh, he didn't have any crew on with him. Oh my God, he said, I left them behind. So we, they backed the train up. Of course, we were flagging the train anyway so they could back up. And they backed down and, and uh, picked us up. And uh, so we were happy to get on the caboose and get in by the stove and warm up a little, see. So that was my first experience walking half of the, uh, the uh, Lexington branch. Mm -hmm.